so let me introduce our speaker, Tish. Tish is an independent consultant assisting all sorts of businesses from manufacturing to early stage startup. Today's talk is about hardware design to measure the distance between bicycles and passing cars in the hope of increasing safety for all road users. Please welcome Tish. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, w welcome everyone. I'll start with an, uh, just a minute, getting AV sorted. I'll start with an acknowledgement to the country. Uh, so today we are gathered in the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge their deep ties to the land and waters of the region and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Most of the work here was done in Adelaide, so I'm coming over from Adelaide, uh, which is the Ghana Nation. So just um, like a sort of a project management style outline of what the talk will be about. This is a sort of a full stack project uh, in, uh, <laughs> uh, about riding bikes, so you're just keeping moving, things moving, um, building hardware, building firmware for that hardware, uh, putting it in a case, uh, recording the data from that hardware, and uh, sort of uh, a call to action to become part of this study, which is called the Velograph. It's using open source tooling. All of this to tooling is open source for putting, uh, putting the devices together for more people to participate in the study in road safety and gather more data or to build the hardware themselves so it can be deployed in other, other parts of the world or other parts of our country. So this sort of uh, work began with uh, the Center for Automotive Safety Research, which is part of Adelaide University. A previous study was done in ACT uh, with around yeah, 11,000 passing events uh, being recorded with different separations. There are laws in Australia for bike riders to car separation, but you can legislate something unless you monitor it. You don't know if it's actually being, you know, being effective. Uh, you can't record videos everywhere it's being passed, or you don't have accurate s separation measurement record, record, records. Um, so the difference in passing distance is sort of associated with road classification, bike lane presence, and speed limits was sort of the overall response. Um, so I just got some numbers around the number of passing events that was in the previous study, uh, and it has in 2019 or so. And uh, the new study that we are going to talk about today has already passed that number of passing events since it was launched uh, like a month or so ago. So there are publications around the previous work this was done, and the hardware there used uh, ultrasonics to measure the separation. And sort of, I'm wearing this fun t-shirt about sh lasers on sharks because this time we're using uh, like lasers to measure the separation, which is more accurate, uh, it's faster uh, uh, rate of capture of data and so on. So this is sort of the amount of data that was captured in Canberra. Uh, uh, around the main CBD areas, various commute areas that people usually ride to work, typically, and uh, the different separation distances that were encountered. Red is sort of bad, too close, passing, blue is on the good side. So the sort of this is a pretty busy, dense slide, but there was sort of the specs I inherited uh, to build this sort of stuff. My involvement was being doing overall systems architecture for this as an independent consultant, working out which pieces could be done, what was out of scope for the target budget size of the hardware. I'll start passing these around. Uh, these are some of the hardware uh, that was put together, various iterations of it. You can pass them around. I have a few of them. So this was sort of the target hardware sizing that was uh, put together. This is the docking unit on which the, which is attached to the bike uh, near the front. And it has a couple of laser distance sensors. 
and I'll keep this one. Uh, this is the main unit on which the CPU sits, uh, and it has got connectors and stuff. We'll talk about more about that. So yeah, so a lot of uh, the target features were essentially to allow cyclists to recharge the device, make it a bit robust, handle vibration, improve the frequency of data capture, and also some sort of uh, enhanced platform capabilities to view the data automatically send the data, that sort of brings a bit of a network constraint. This is not an IoT device we're talking about. It's actually a logger, more like a data logger rather than an IoT connected device, and sort of process the data. So yeah, so I swear, sort of, uh, I started working with Jamie. So I did uh, this work, uh, but Dr. Jamie McKenzie is the project lead. He sort of did a lot of the uh, wrangling all of the supporters together, conceptualizing. He worked mostly on the previous study and set this up. So I have done work with the lab previously modeling vehicles uh, using cameras and sort of uh, 3D modeling technologies uh, to, for creating soft cars, which is what they call uh, for testing detection of cars by automated driving systems. So if you have a collision with this soft car, it's not damaging. So they just put a, make a foam car and put it on a platform and then drive this around in a test range and see how automated driving systems detect this soft car. So I worked on a bit of that. I have presented at the conference previously about energy monitors. So Jamie has one of them, so he was familiar with my work around that. So sort of got involved with this project, so excluding myself and Jamie, the other people involved in doing the websites, the data analysis, and the hardest part is obviously device deployment. Every bike is slightly different, and that requires custom fitting of the cabling and the device to the bike, where it will go. Uh, so uh, each fitting takes around 20 minutes to a half an hour. So that's the sort of the challenge in rolling this sort of measuring device out uh, to lots and lots of users, other than designing and making them, of course. So this is sort of the wrangling, the supporting network to get the project offline was uh, obviously, uh, Jamie works for the University of Adelaide and I contracted with them to get most of the work done. Uh, this was supported by the Australian Government Office of Road Safety, a city government. Uh, various bi bicycle network and pedal power are bicycle advi uh, advocacy groups, encouraging more people to ride and making sure the environment is safe for riding and the website and data processing pipelines were done by inside via artificial intelligence. So the new study, uh, other than just doing SET Canberra, aims to cover multiple cities, run over longer periods, include more and diverse participants, have aggregated anonymized data available for researchers for further work, or, and also develop open source friendly generic hardware that other cities can adopt, build their own, and produce more of these devices for logging for themselves. So the sort of designing a piece of hardware, designing any technology is sort of a series of choices. And when you make those choices, you stick yourself to a path that you may sort of cannot come back from or the project gets delayed sort of deal. So the the first choice we had to make was what was the host CPU to use or host board to use. So we're not working at a very low level. We're not designing complex high-speed boards. We're just taking an off-the-shelf, fairly integrated board and building a larger device around it. So that we did like a decision matrix called, I found out these are called the Pew matrices with little uh, scores on various features we wanted on the board and uh, how these different things rated. So the top of the list was the Tinsy, which you see there, and the uh, Pi board, which is a MicroPython board. Um, so I tried to get the Tinsy. Tinsy was obviously top of the list with its high speed and built-in microSD card support and lots of stuff that was good about it. But I tried to get one from Mouser, and Mouser repeatedly rejected sending it to me due to ITAR regulations. So he dropped it. <laughs> I'm on some list somewhere. <laughs> uh, so they, I, we had to drop down to the Pi board, which uh, was sort of in, done mostly in Melbourne. And we reached out to 
DM in on Slack, and we ended up getting the last 140 Pi boards around in the world. So, so if you are trying to get a MicroPython Pi board and you're wondering where they went, they are all attached to bikes. <laughs> um, the other piece of core hardware in this is essentially the LiDAR, or the laser distance measurement sensor. So the, the LiDAR uh, modules have become pretty commonplace now compared to you know, a few, even a few years ago to three years ago. And it ha we tried first to take a hardware device and build our own LiDAR module. But that proved yeah, too hard because we had to put on our secondary CPU to read the LiDAR itself. Uh, and so that was a more involved de design exercise. So I chose to pick up something off the shelf, this TF Mini Plus, which is probably, other than the CPU, most expensive part of this kit. Um, uh, so this, uh, so it's sort of, there are two TF Mini Pluses on the system, which are mounted at the front and back of the bike and they measure the passing event. So when a car comes past, it passes the back sensor first and then the front sensor. So you can see that it was uh, a forward passing event. So you expect a bit of a gap there. Based on the speeds at which the cars travel, let's say 60 or 80 k's, uh, you, that's why you need the very high sampling speed compared to ultrasonics and other, other systems in order to make sure you get the passing or forward sort of event. Um, and also, it uh, indicates uh, velocity of the vehicle as well, in a way. You get a speed measurement. So the other bit of hardware, or third most, ex most expensive component of the kit is the GPS. So choosing the GPS is sort of, uh, again, uh, an exercise in uh, cost and complexity management and sort of hardware integration management. You can, on the on one side, we have like a RTK capable GPS. Uh, RTK stands for real time kinematics. So they give very uh, high accurate post process GPS, but they produce lots of data that you need to sort of correct afterwards. And other side, you have basic, not so accurate GPS that will give you an indication of a time and approximately within 10 meters where the bike was. Um, so just for, uh, reducing data volume and cost reasons, we chose the not so accurate GPS and chose to fix it in post because the assumption is we don't need to accurately know where the cyclist is. We will align it to the known road vectors, which is data quite commonly available. So a uh, bit of a show and tell. So the open source component of the electronics design was essentially we took mostly easily available hardware, open source hardware, um, or some integrated piece of hardware like the TF Mini Plus, and put it together using fairly simplistic um, uh, boards in KiCad. So KiCad, for those who don't know, is a leading open source eCAD electronics design tool. Uh, it came from uh, originally from CERN because th they were designing huge amounts of electronics for themselves. And it also makes this design, when it's public, reproducible for others because you don't need to license a separate eCAD tool to do iterations on the design if you need to. So I'll quickly bring up the board. So this is one of the main boards, just a bunch of connectors and a mezzanine board on which the Pi board sits. And the cool thing with this one is you can actually attach step models to each component on this board. So that becomes, um, so I'm jumping ahead. So that it becomes like this in KiCad, so you can actually see the 3D model parts of the board. And that becomes important when you're designing uh, enclosures and other bits. So gives you an idea of the stack up, the battery, the c different connectors. Um, so Jamie did a lot of this 3D STL stuff. He's a mechatronics PhD, so he's much better at these things than me. Uh, so it looks really cool. Let's just hop back to the presentation. So 
So yeah, so the making the electronics consists of four separate boards. It's a board stack, and they're designed. KiCad doesn't do a project with multiple boards in it. You have to design each board separately, but you can generate 3D models out of them. So the main ones are the sort of connecting the sensors on, having a user interface, just buttons and LEDs, no screen. It's very basic. It's designed for outdoor usage. You don't want to make it too complicated. The bike will have spills on their bikes and stuff. You don't want a mess out there. Um, and uh, a mezzanine board to break out the pipe board and something to host the battery and the GPS and other things. Rather than building custom hardware, this sort of thing could be done using an app or something. Riders usually have their phone in that thing, so in their back uh, riding jacket. Uh, but uh, then you'd need Bluetooth or similar things to stream the data. That may be a feature iteration where you have a Bluetooth-enabled device uh, getting accurate GPS from the phone and just focusing on the LiDAR and the distance measurement aspects of it. So from sort of, uh, it was a, from here it was a jump into either I go into the enclosure and the mechanical engineering aspects or I just talk a little bit about the firmware and the software aspects. So I'll just talk a little bit about the firmware aspects of it. So the firmware is fairly simple, high level, because we chose a MicroPython board. Uh, most of the engineering team are mechatronics engineers, automotive safety engineers. You don't want to do low level embedded coding in a custom microcontroller. Uh, you just want to be able to maintain and iterate it. Most of my input on this was to make sure that the maintenance team had sufficient skill to continue working on this project after the initial design was done. You didn't need low-level assembly skills to make, make it keep working. And other bike en enthusiasts could use it in somewhere else in the world without learning dif difficult things, uh, setting up their own compiler tool chains or whatnot. Uh, so yeah, so that was sort of the MicroPython was an easy choice for that, and uh, multiple CPUs these days support MicroPython, and uh, uh, they're fairly easily available. So if in the future, if you mo choose to move to an ESP RISC V based different architecture other than the STM32 Pi board, you could move to those ones uh, and redesign the electronics inside the enclosure to fit. Uh, so the firmware, the, the fun part of the firmware is, uh, that MicroPython has is the sort of uh, lots of sensor reading at different speeds. So GPS is read at 1 hertz. The fastest thing is the LiDAR, which is read at 50 hertz. Uh, the temperature is read at 1 hertz. And the other thing is how long can you keep logging. So the battery and the power management is quite important. So the battery levels are read. And if the battery goes too low, then it goes to sleep sort of deal to keep all the logs in place. We also need to write a flash to a micro SD card, all of the logs, uh, which uh, uh, MicroPython provides a cool way to appear as a storage device when you plug in. Uh, so you can do off offload the device by just plugging it in and making the micro SD card look as a dri dri USB drive. So it makes it really easy for people to, without a custom client, to get the log files off and upload them to the web, web service. So the hardware versions will go up probably, and our logging format has to change uh, as we include. So that's the other bit of thing I had to sort out, was essentially getting a logging format. I sort of badly just invented another standard, I guess, for saving the logs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I looked at various uh, libraries for uh, saving things like Parquet and other file formats to save the logs in a standard form, but uh, that none were available for MicroPython. So I just invented like a bit-packed binary struct style library with a CRC where you can batch and write to the microSD. In the future, we may go back to a more standard way of uh, saving all of the data. Um, so, yeah, so that's sort of the consideration here. We came up with a custom format called .velo, where the files are written. And 
the fun part wa with MicroPython was uh, we could do that instead of uh, doing uh, when this is timer this, load this uh, uh, sensor or a timer this, write this out in an infinite loop. Uh, with MicroPython, we could do like a sort of a more abstract approach and implement some coroutines where you could ha you have independent functions which would read the sensors and just sleep. And then the uh, single thread scheduler in MicroPython will wake up the right coroutine and do do the uh, do, the, do the appropriate function, making it much more abstractable. So I'm just gonna quickly show the sort of the coroutine part of it. So uh, there's not too much code in this presentation. It's mostly just pictures of hardware uh, stuff. This is the data logger part of it, which has got this little async infinite loops uh, for writing logs, another another read distance, and it's uh, just an async infinite loop. And most of the time, it's just sleeping and waiting for doing the next one. So it has got the reading of the distance sensor, updating of the GPS uh, buffer, reading the GPS buffer from the UART, uh, reading temperature, reading voltages from the batteries, and then a little heartbeat LED. So everything is implemented as uh, uh, async IO coroutine style stuff in this high level way. And then you just create this outside loop and make all of the sub coroutines run un underneath it. So in the future, if you add more sensors or something else, you can just create new coroutines and hopefully they're not thrashing over each other. So yeah, so that was like a really cool uh, way to use MicroPython and use those coroutines to ha just gradually build up different sensors and make sure they all work. <sighs> and uh, also the user input for pressing the power switch and anything else was detected. So now I'll go back to the hardware bits uh, around the casing and design. So most of the uh, mechanical design was done in uh, FreeCAD. Uh, so FreeCAD is a parametric modeling solid uh, engineering CAD tool. Um, Jamie honestly did most of the work here being a mechatronics mechanical engineer. Uh, he just picked up all of the ECAD stuff, exported it out to STL, which I was showing is what you can do out of KiCAD and uh, you can then take it into a mechanical design tool, put it in and start putting casings around the electronics assemblies uh, and sort of have pretty good confidence that they will fit. So one of the gotchas I got from previously designing it is that in addition to working, making sure it will fit, you need to make sure that they will, you can slide that electronics assembly into, into the mechanical. So you have to have a bit of clearance for rotation so that things can slide in. So 3D printing really helped with doing lots and lots of iterations of the enclosure, making sure you got the right size before you got, went and got lots of them made. So the project never really did injection molding or anything. So all of the enclosures you see floating around, and this one, this is the enclosure in the diagram that uh, is actually printed uh, by PCBWay. You know, it's pretty solid, high density, and you can hardly see the layering in there. It's pretty thin layers, so it's pretty solid. And then there is uh, mounts for the LiDAR sensors and stuff with vinyl uh, that you put onto the bike and any amount of <laughs> uh, cable ties to make sure nothing falls off when, when it actually goes on. So uh, FreeCAD had uh, a problem called uh, a topological naming problem. So when, whenever you have a stacked up assembly tree and you changed one part down in the uh, uh, ECAD, uh, MK, in the CAD, uh, the entire thing will fall and crash. So they're, uh, they're still looking for help in fixing the topological naming problem. So I'll just go over FreeCAD a little bit just to show all the open source tooling we're using. So this is, uh, as I was saying, the STL exported from KiCAD can be seen here. It's sort of the same uh, step file uh, with the different parts of it. And you can turn on the different parts of the cap. 
So that's the, that's the cap there. The, the actual extrusion of the tube uh, on a rare cap. And then there is the, uh, the actual main board there, which is imported from KiCad. So yeah, so all of the STL files are available or uh, for printing and other people to build uh, a similar device. So the other big part of building these things is the connectors and the screws and all of that stuff. So uh, any any device that, that's sort of uh, out there is subject to vibration and stuff, they live a rough life. And so that this is where it will most likely fail. So most of the connect connector choices made for even for PCBs were through holes so that they had more mechanical strength in them. And uh, the there's one external facing thing in here, which is essentially this button. So it's sort of outdoor rated, and we try to keep everything else uh, on the inside. So this USB connector is also outdoor rated, uh, but it's not designed to be sort of exposed to rain, so it doesn't have a cover and such. So, so the way it fits in, yeah, the boards you have there, it slots on, and this is on the inside. And so the only thing exposed on the outside is, um, is, the, is the switch. So a fair amount of time was spent assembling all of the PCBs. Adelaide University got their own reflow oven, got a bunch of uh, postdocs and grad students to put the, put the boxes together. So uh, overall around 140 units were built. So the the unit also has uh, different modes, basically logging and programming based on how it goes into the dock and it detects the pins that are in and that acts as a sensor. And then when you take it off, it becomes like a storage device and goes off logging mode. And that sort of the putting it in the dock and pulling out acts as a sort of as a switching uh, mode as well. Uh, the most of the Equipment and battery is just housed in here. So set, setting up the bulk, as you can see, like I almost looks like you're planning to do some Bitcoin mining or something with USB hubs. So lots, <laughs> a big USB hub with lots of US, uh, things to charge up all of the units in the mass assembly line. Um, and the charging should be monitored because uh, even though it's 1860 50s are relatively stable, they're still fire hazards. Uh, hopefully there, there will be no leaks or accidents. And this is the s sort of, we are now going to the last part of the presentation where it's not what's out, what comes out of it. This is the cr bad custom format I invented to pack the different uh, values into it um, uh, and make it easier to on the memory and storing on the SD card. Not that the SD card runs out of space, it's just easier to flush the smaller binary files on. So this is like a, will take up longer than I have talked. This is a sort of a sample of a passing event. Uh, so one of the compromises we had to make during the design of the device was to not include cameras because we would need a higher level device with UVC video capability to have the cameras on and then put this together. So this was this is a synthetic video with the device logging distance and the b rider having cameras on the side and then it's stitched together again in the post to demonstrate what it looks like. So this is a relatively safe ride with most of the passing distances, more than one and a half meters. Uh, but you can see the yellow edge where the car is first seen and the red edge when the car passes by and the sort of the changing distance between the rider uh, and the uh, rider and the vehicle on the outside. You can sort of get an idea of the far furthest distance the laser sensors see up to three meters away. And the uh, legislation says the car passing distance is one and a half meters and then one meter uh, on a, uh, 
So most of the passing here is relatively safe. Uh, the rider is indicating out because it's a parked vehicle. Uh, they're coming out onto the road. Cars are still making space for her. And then back onto the bike lane. So the passing behavior shifts based on whether there is a bike lane or not. So uh, we'll see what the study comes out. But typically, if there is a bike lane, passing distances are actually smaller than if there isn't. <laughs> Uh, so I've got so this is, I've got a sample here of uh, closer pass. So a lot of the passes in this particular video are cl closer, much closer than the other one. Scroll forward a bit. So you can see here the one and a half meter passing distance is not there. So these videos are up on YouTube, and I will make the slide deck public, and more data will come up, probably not with video, but more aggregated data of uh, a I'll rerun the slideshow. So yeah, so the recordings are uploaded in this sort of web UI. So there's a pr site, project.fellowgraph.app. And once you sign up, you get a custom code. And uh, the devices are usually passed around between people by the bicycle advocacy groups or the castle lab where they're fitted. And you get a custom code with which to upload your data. You don't have to share any of your details other than what's here. Um, uh, when we were fitting one of the bikes, one of the people just made a comment that oh, all of my stuff is logged in Strava anyway. But you know, the privacy stuff uh, is uh, interesting, and uh, university has to abide by those. What, what people share publicly is sort of a matter of opinion and comfort with that sort of data. Uh, you just have to say how far you are so that the measurement can be taken from the edge of the bike to the outside. So, uh, and then this is sort of a sample. Uh, the, as I was saying, we fixed the GPS in post uh, because it's a pretty cheap and nasty GPS. Uh, and the GPS is automatically snapped into the roadway or, where appropriate uh, after, uh, in post processing. Uh, the passing events are identified and displayed. So uh, the user, whoever uploaded the data, has access to their passing events. Uh, and they can ch come back and check on that because every user gets a custom code to upload their data with. And uh, symbols are sort of colored in based on the distance. So green means good, uh, pale green means not closer, and then red, orange means getting, yeah, red means it's less than the legal limit. So, yeah, so project.velograph.app uh, is sort of the sign in page. Uh, you can log in and upload your data there. You can sign up. Uh, Melbourne is one of the sites where volunteers are being requested for uh, participation in the study. Uh, registration is open. Uh, so until June is the plan. But uh, we, it can be extended if the supporting bodies can provide the sort of the installation uh, and then as more uh, partner organizations are found in other cities, uh, they can also set up the devices. 
as long as the devices don't break, we can keep circling them around. So this is sort of uh, the invitation, not so public invitation. To, uh, Jamie has it still on his private GitHub uh, to build and remax, remix. So all of the data is uh, there. Uh, it has been worked on for a while. This, I took the screenshot a while ago. Uh, we're sort of waiting University UA, uh, University of Adelaide permission to make it public. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and um, that's the end of my talk. The device looks pretty cool when it's all wrapped up in uh, vinyl. Um, and uh, the study has been running and it has 56 users. Yeah, 23,000 passing events have been detected. Jamie just sent me the stats earlier to me, uh, which is sort of already more than the previous study that took place in Canberra in just a month or so so that it will keep running and we'll hopefully gather more data across multiple cities. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that the, you're recording ambient temperature, I presume outside temperature. What are we going to do with that data? Uh, so the temperatures being recorded are ambient temperature and road surface temperature. Uh, so uh, so that sort of is another, it's not related to the separation, but it's the other part of the research around the traction that the bike gets and riding conditions and so on. When you get a close, when you get a close passing event, by how much can you boost the laser power? <laughs> uh, to be safe, it's only a measuring device, right? So it's an outdoor measuring device. It's not a l laser weapon, so <laughs> it's it's not power is not boosted. Does the project plan on doing any computer vision on the data uh, from the camera? It's like, you know, make and model of cars yeah. that are so passing that closer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, that brings another sort of challenge around privacy and recording the number plates. The, currently, the project doesn't have cameras integrated in it because it's using a very low-level microprocessor, right? So it doesn't have, my, uh, the STEM32 MicPi board doesn't have support for video and cameras. So if you move up the stack to a like a Raspberry Pi or some other Linux capable device which has UVC video and you can put the cameras on, uh, but there you could do it. There was a study done uh, in the sort of road safety area with ca uh, cameras mounted in intersections, which is one of the areas where most of the collisions occur that uh, the cars turn without looking at cyclists. Um, and that, that used computer vision to identify cyclists and cars coming past that in intersection. This was a fixed camera study. How long did you spend uh, developing the hardware? Uh, the, it went in bits and pieces, so at least six months. Uh, doing the mechanical engineering, the hardware, the electronics engineering parts of it, different iterations of it. I was wondering, is UV an issue with degrading the 3D printed bits or? Uh, they, they are covered. Uh, they have got vinyl covering on them, similar to vinyl covering people apply on their cars and stuff. Uh, so, uh, there we will find out how the casing goes uh, out in the wild. I'm wondering, um, like failure modes of the like commercial hardware that you're using, like the boards and that. Have you found them standing up to the task of this, or? Um, yeah, so um, some some of them like uh, in the bring up fail, like this is a failed unit. <laughs> uh, the 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 con connections and stuff hasn't failed yet, so it has been going for a month and there have been no unit failure. So there have been forty six units out there. Uh, they haven't failed in a month, so well, the study only has to last three months or so. Uh, 
<laughs> and after that, we'll have to probably do new versions and such. Thank you. Um, do you have the, uh, the the unit cost of the the each each unit? You yeah, produce? yeah. So the because this was a sort of a government funded project, there was a fixed budget to which you were working to. So that was uh, the cost was five hundred dollars a unit. The most expensive parts are the lasers, which uh, retail are around seventy dollars each, and the pie board obviously is the other most expensive part of it, and then lots of labor and stuff in putting it in. I had a question just more about the the research with the I noticed with the the data the users have to put in, and they need to provide those measurements from their bikes. Will there be um, statistical sort of checks to uh, to look at the accuracy of that data entry? Um, you know, if if a user got put the wrong entry, wrong data, wrong measurements in, yeah. that could affect the passing distance. Yeah, there there would be a bit of checks. So the UI actually has like min max sort of sensible limits on it uh, when you actually go to use it uh, and uh, definitely will affect the stats but it's just approximate numbers are fine for the passing distance you have an actual distance from the sensor okay so I think um, that's about all the questions that we have. So thank you so much no for sharing with us. And I think you'll be still around, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please talk to him. Yes, and um, some of the units are yeah. still here. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, we'll <laughs> get them <laughs> back <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yep. They're not in production. <laughs> yeah. And also, give. Thank you.